Good evening. Palo palo everyone and welcome to tonight's Goodfellow Unit webinar on chronic pain. My name is Dr. Hazel Fuyava. I'm a GP in South Auckland and I work for the Goodfellow Unit. And tonight we're very lucky to have Dr. Buzz Burrow with us. I'm just going to introduce Buzz. So Buzz graduated in London and then completed general physician training in the UK before immigrating to New Zealand. The excitement of rural hospital medicine and primary care saw Buzz working in Reefton on the West Coast, occasionally the Chatham Islands, and then remotely in the Pilbara of Western Australia. Buzz established a semi-rural general practice in Renwick near Blenheim and was a GP with special interest in chronic pain in Nelson. He has just about completed training as a pain medicine specialist in Auckland and now works part-time as an SMO for the Auckland Regional Pain Service. And now I will hand over to Buzz. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Tanakota Kato and uh, no my Harry my um, uh, and a very warm welcome and thank you so much for everybody who's attending uh, to give me the opportunity to evangelize on something which I it hold very dear to my heart and probably have done for the last probably nearly thirty seven years. Um, chronic persistent pain it fascinates me for lots of reasons, and I'll go through that for the talk. But I think not least of which is uh, I, I've been qualified nearly 37 years and probably only started to understand it about three years ago. And that's in spite of working with it for as long as I have. So to share with you um, the, the, the sort of the nuggets of what I think I've picked up it is such a privilege. And I am really hoping that I can just get the timing right so I can answer as many questions as possible and uh, and look, be prepared uh, for the answer, including, I don't know, uh, and I'm getting progressively better at that. So I am, um, I think uh, I'll start with a wonderful quote from Voltaire and uh, my um, advice to anybody giving a medical talk, just dip into Voltaire, it's full of so many quotes, but this one probably wraps up chronic pain as better than any. Um, I apologize for the um, sexism on that, but he, he did do this in the uh, 1700s, so I'll forgive him. He says, doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of whom they know nothing. And here we are in 2024, and that really does apply to chronic persistent pain now, probably more than ever. Uh, and you'll see as the talk unfolds that one theme I wish to stick through this is one of modesty but uh what, what am I going to talk through and talk about um I, I'm going to give you some statistics it's really important what are we talking about and certainly the the magnitude of chronic persistent pain I then want to try and keep a theme going through until the end really including the Q&A that um we're moving away from opinion, moving away from anecdotes and moving into evidence base. And I want to talk about the neurobiology behind chronic pain. And in particular, a very common thing, which is uh, why doesn't the medicine which I gave this patient work? And uh, certainly in, in my professional career, that's something which has consistently um, upset me. The sort of here, have this medicine. And then weeks later, I took the medicine, it didn't work. Uh, and um, initially, I, I, I thought, you're not taking it, but uh, I need to explain why it doesn't work. In particular, I want to touch on opioids. They, they are overused, overprescribed, over relied on, and over demanded by the patients. Uh, and uh, and they actually don't work. They're not indicated. I want to touch on why. And then also uh, in the same vein, I, I, I want to be almost neutral with medicinal cannabis. Simply just give you the evidence, uh, and um, and then leave it up to you. Make your own mind up. Um, I think it's important I do touch on how our chronic persistent pain people assessed uh, in tertiary centres uh, and then bring in some reality. And then needless to say, of course, the questions I'm looking forward to. So why be interested? Uh, this is New Zealand data. This isn't international. This is New Zealand. The total annual cost chronic pain is to this country is estimated to be $15 billion a year. That's in lost revenue in uh, working income payments, et cetera, et cetera. The actual um, health burden, 5% of what we do is chronic persistent pain. That is more than diabetes and smoking combined is spent on and lost on chronic pain. The GDP, 1.7% of our GDP is spent on chronic persistent pain. Health alone, the health costs $2 billion a year we spend on looking after, and I'll come back to the loose term, looking after people with chronic pain. This is a uh, lovely quote from a superior report, probably about seven years ago now, commissioned by the Faculty of Pain Medicine to look at the concept of chronic persistent pain. And are we are we doing as well as we could? Need to say we're not. Um, and uh, this is a lovely quote, awareness of pain and pain management is low amongst health practitioners and consumers. They, they were very politely saying there's two groups of people should know 
more about chronic persistent pain, that's doctors and patients. And uh, and um, I, I really hope by the end of this three quarters now, at least half of that statement will be proven to be incorrect. So wish me luck. What I thought I'd um, invite you to do um, is uh, I'm just going to run through five questions, which I'd love you to either in your head or write down or whatever, um, what answers you would give this. And then I'll go through the five questions at the end. It'll sort of just frame what uh, I'm going to be talking about. And 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 hopefully uh, when we go through these at the end, uh, I, I hope that some of you will think, oh, God, I learned something there. And if you do, well, that's great. It was worth my while um, uh, deferring the glass of wine until after I've given this talk. So there's five questions. Um, so the first one. We've got a 52-year-old gentleman. He's caught his hand in some machinery at work one hour ago. He's got a compound fracture of his hand and he's in severe pain. So A, is this pain acute, nociceptive, non-cancer pain? True or false? B, true or false? An oral opioid is an appropriate pharmacological treatment for this gentleman. Is that a true statement or false statement? C, the patient should be warned of the risk of addiction to opioids. True or false? Suitable non-pharmacological treatments include reassurance. A true statement or a false statement? And last, for this first question, pain medication should not be given until the surgeon has seen the patient. Is that true or false? Try hand at question two. So we have a 54-year-old woman. She's just had a laparotomy for bowel obstruction secondary to cancer. The pre-op chest x-ray shows probable secondaries. And you're looking at, at her on the surgical ward very soon after the operation. She's got severe post-operative pain. So is this pain chronic, nociceptive cancer pain? True or false? Next, anxiety is likely to be an important factor, is it or isn't it? Next, reassurance that she's been completely cured is an appropriate non-pharmacological treatment. Is that a true statement or do you disagree with it? Next, opioids are contraindicated because they will delay a return of normal bowel function. True or false? Last, opioids should only be given for one day to prevent addiction. Question three, a 75 year old man, he's got a two year history of lower back pain. He reports he's had back injury years ago and his doctor can't see anything unusual on the x-ray. A, true or false, this pain is acute neuropathic non-cancer pain. B, a three-month supply of a strong opioid like morphine or oxycodone should be prescribed for him to take home. C. The patient looks calm, so the pain cannot be severe. Is that a true or false statement? D. The patient should be asked about pain at rest and when walking. And last question on this one. It is important to use both non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatments for his pain. Question four. We've got a 23-year-old woman. She's got a severe injury to her leg, leading to a surgical below-knee amputation six months ago. And she's got pain in the missing foot. True or false, this pain is chronic neuropathic non-cancer pain. Next, true or false, she should be reassured the pain is not really there. Next, explanation is an appropriate non-pharmacological treatment. Is that true or false? D, gabapentin is an appropriate pharmacological treatment. And last, strong opioids are an appropriate pharmacological treatment for this lady. True or false statement? And the last one, just to wet your whistle, and then we'll launch in and um, uh, educate you on all these issues. A 55-year-old woman, she's got a two-year history of breast cancer. She's got severe back pain for the last two weeks, and x-rays have shown spinal secondaries. A, this pain is acute, nociceptive cancer pain. True or false? B, opioids are likely to be an important pharmacological treatment here. Next, the patient should be warned there is a high risk of addiction to opioids. And the next, reassurance that all will be well is an appropriate non-pharmacological treatment. And last but no means least, the family may report that the patient has pain rather than the patient themselves. I hope there's what you whistle and uh, I'm looking forward to going through the answers um, when I've educated you. But the next one, I'm going to really make you work for the enjoyment of this. Just spend a few seconds in your own mind. What is the definition of pain? If somebody were to march up to you in the street and say, what's the definition of pain? I must confess, when I was challenged with this, I thought, well, something hurts, doesn't it? Uh, I um, it, it's, something, it's a word we use, but but do we actually know the real definition of it? Um, so just have a, just a few seconds. If you were to explain to a medical student, what is the definition of pain? What words would you use? 
And uh, I'll just give you a few more seconds and then I'll press this and, and give you the International Association of the Study of Pain, their current um, working definition of what exactly is pain. And they say it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. I must confess, I, I when I saw that, I um, it made sense, but it was nothing like what was going through my mind. And I'm more than curious um, if you compare and contrast what's in front of us there to what was going through your mind. Um, so, what um, when we use the word pain, needless to say, and as you saw in the questions, we, we, we've got different types of pain, and, uh, and we're good at some and not so good at others. And and so the three basic, simplest ways of describing pain is either nociceptive neuropathic or nociplastic and um, the nociceptive pain i think we all know that that's um that's the acute pain that's the stubbed your toe that's the um uh it, when nociceptors are activated and they're telling the brain something horrible is happening uh you better know about it that's a nociceptive pain now neuropathic pain uh, needless to say the, the the true definition of it is uh, a, a disease or lesion of the somatosensory system and and so we we see that in the absence of not exception per se, but of course we really see it. Um, the classical sciatica, post-stroke pain, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, trigeminal neuralgia, which gosh, uh, that's uh, the suicide condition, post-hepatic neuralgia in any shape or form, small fiber neuropathies and painful polyneuropathy. They're just a list of, uh, of, of probably the most common ones, but gosh, it, the list goes on. So we've got those two types of pain. I think we're both used to those, but we're sort of... Um, uh, used to seeing but not used to dealing with effectively is the nociceptive pain. That's when when it's neither nociceptive nor neuropathic, um, and that's the pain which really bewilders us, and and that's the pain which 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 um, uh, we see in the tertiary centres ninety nine percent of the time, and that's when when it's neither nociceptive nor neuropathic. That's the fire alarm going off when there isn't a fire or increase heat or smoke or anything. It's just uh, almost lying to us. Uh, and needless to say, um, uh, chronic headaches, vulvodynia, interstitial cystitis, all the central sensitization syndromes, uh, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, chronic fatigue. Um, uh, the list goes on. Chronic pelvic pain. Uh, th th this is this is when pain shouldn't be there, but people are, are experiencing. So uh, let's probably talk about more than that, more about that because a really common thing when it's not nociplastic either there isn't a big hole in somebody's leg or when it's not neuropathic either they've not had a stroke got ms or or had a proper um nerve damage um we can't see anything and and very often patients are accused it must be all in my head uh, they've got back pain the blood tests are normal the back the spine x-ray is normal the mri is normal uh, and and they, they can't go back to work because the pain is so severe uh, and they they see an orthopedic surgeon who says well there's nothing wrong with you it's all in your head um so is it all in the head uh, and but one could argue you've sort of got the few answers to that i mean probably some of this of course it is um uh, the, the head is like a tv screen uh, it, it's it's receiving messages and the best way to make sure it's not in the head is to get some general anesthetic so so yes of course it's in the head but um Let's let's get a bit deeper than that, uh, because our head is doing its absolute best to make sense of the information given to it. Now, this is um, probably one of the most famous um, uh, optical illusions. Um, now, if we look at square A and look at square B, our head is receiving all the information which is in front of us there, including the fact B is in the shadow where A isn't. So the question which um, the the designer of this optical illusion asks people is uh, is a exactly the same shade of gray as as b or is b a lighter shade of gray now then uh, the as you can probably sense where this is going if you haven't seen it before as it happens a is exactly the same shade as b the trouble is uh when we look on the left hand side of that screen even knowing that a is the same shade as b our brains aren't going to get that. Uh, if B is in the shadow, it has to be darker. Therefore, it's the same shade. It has to be lighter. Uh, and so there's our brain that's being absolutely completely messed with. It's receiving information, trying to make sense of information and coming up with the wrong conclusion. And to a certain degree, that is part of the problem of the central nervous system when we've got chronic persistent pain, which is how it's said it's welcome. And all the parameters, be they radiological, the laboratory, everything else, are telling us that there should not be pain, but there is. And that then lends itself to the common thing we all see, 
why do painkillers, oh God, I love that word painkillers, implying that they should be killing the pain. Why don't they kill the pain? What, why, if anything, are people worse off? Um, they're appearing every three months to get a repeat prescription for their um, uh, pain reducing medication, but they're still in severe pain, can't work. Uh, and if anything, they're going backwards. Why don't they work anymore? And this is where I wish to go with this one. This then lends itself to the neurobiology. This is this is um, no longer, uh, so I wonder whether this does, no longer opinion. Let's look at the true science behind it. And to say that this is uh, what keeps me going and what make, makes me get up in the morning. And But to do this, we've got to understand the difference between sudden pain acute pain i stubbed my toe this morning and it still hurts to chronic pain i stubbed my toe six months ago why does my entire leg hurt now even though my toe is healed the difference between acute pain and chronic pain and just just to be a little bit pedantic the definition of chronic pain is pain which has persisted for more than three months so what is happening well needless to say i think this is a bit of um, a first year medicine uh biology we all know the concept of the first order neuron second order neuron and third order neuron the first order neuron is the nociceptive focus and that goes to the spinal cord from the spinal cord the second order neuron goes off to the brain and then between the thalamus and the sensory cortex we've got the third or third order in inverted commas neuron although needless to say there's quite a bit of a neuronal pathway there <clears throat> to sort of um sweeten that up ever so slightly if we look on the right there uh, i've missed out the first order neuron there and whiffling off to the thalamus and you see between the thalamus and that post central gyrus the little um red thing there there's there's quite a journey it, it goes through quite a few ganglia the pre prefrontal cortex gets involved and all these questions need to be asked about the information going to the post central gyrus um where is it coming from what does it remind us of have we had it before what are we currently doing at the time are we being chased by a saber tooth tiger or relaxing or having an argument um are we sober are we drunk all these need to be put in and then the brain tries to make sense of it in the same way it tried to make sense out of the a and b squares we saw earlier now then what i want to draw your attention to is just um outlined there just below the thalamus is that pag the peri aqueductal gray matter i just want to flag that there because we're going to come back to that because that is sitting there looking quite innocent at the moment but that's a really crucial part of, of what we can do down the track to start to help patients a little bit along their journey there so why do we feel chronic pain? Now, I'm going to break a, a, a few rules here. Um, but um, uh, again, just to remind you, we've got that first order neuron and it goes to the dorsal horn and uh, and interfaces with the um, next spinothalamic tract, which uh, is on its way to tell the brain there's some pain. And I just wish to just focus on that bit there. As I said before, um, when patients are saying is pain all in my head well to be honest with you one could argue well your head is perceiving it but that little bit in the red square is probably the most important part of the whole lot um and i'm just going to expand on that a little bit more uh, and amplify that so uh a yellow is the first order neuron the gray is the second order neuron i've just put it that way because the slide which explains it best is upside down um and again, I'm just going to expand on this interface there. The yellow, the first, the grey is on its way. So the person we're looking at at the moment is standing on their heads. And this is an unnecessarily busy slide, but I'll just try and unpack it because th this really is more than more than explains an awful lot about the concept of chronic pain. So let's go for it. I'm going to split it up. So we've got on the left hand side, the acute pain just stub the toe and uh, and it says gosh you've just stub your toe there's broken skin maybe a broken bone you really need to get that sorted out and tell the brain about that and make you limp um and you see that glutamate is squirted from the first order neuron caught by these ampa receptors and that says i'm going to tell the brain about it if you just look to the left of there you've got these nmda receptors and they're hard asleep they're plugged with magnesium they're bored they're, they're disinterested this is acute pain not their gig uh until we enter the realm of chronic pain and and also sensitization. And with the chronic pain, you see there's a few changes now. And that um, interface, that synapse, now it gets much busier. And we've got more glutamate being poured there. Substance P joins in the argument. But more importantly, if you look at this NMDA receptor, the magnesium plug's fallen out of that. And that NMDA receptor now is now firing away. Now, they are nasty little receptors um, in the second order neuron interface because not only... Um, are they joining in with the AMPA receptors? But when everything's healed, when everything's gone away, those NMDA receptors can just keep firing because they can. Um, so everything gets better and the NMDA receptor refuses to believe everything's got better and it keeps telling the brain, yeah, no, the toe is still broken, um, even when it isn't. 
Even worse, they can phone a friend by interneurons next door and phone their friend who looks after the knee and says, well, I'm looking after the toe. Do you mind telling the brain you're hurting as well? And because of such mates and the interneurons are so good, that'll join in too. And all these extra chemicals we see, including substance B and many other inflammatory mediators, not only are happening there, but they will start to happen up the spinal cord and inside the brain. And we have a, an effect, a, a cascade of inflammatory mediators now all in effect telling lies to the brain that there's pain everywhere uh, and and all the toes are broken and the knees broken and why not join the hands as well and we end up with way 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 too common a problem that's a chronic widespread pain which is hitherto known as fibromyalgia and and that is the process of sensitization and transition from acute pain to chronic pain now then if we start therefore asking the question why don't painkillers work anymore because all the painkillers we learned about at med school all the painkillers we learned about at high at, at as as house surgeons they look after the left hand side we're really good at acute pain we are hopeless at chronic pain because we've got a totally different neurobiology so what does that mean and as i said before i think the, the important thing is um i was going to stitch the theme of modesty into into what we talk about and and this is a lovely quote from the bmj um probably about 12 years ago now but it it, it just it just um puts us in our place uh, and and it says uh, embracing high failure rates is the first step to what we do pronouncing about the importance of failure is rare in science and we believe that pain medicine has now reached a degree of maturity where it can confront its failings and and i am it is it is heartwarming to see that written there we we don't do that enough to say i don't know um we don't do enough to say to patients we're doing our best but i'm not going to get rid of all your pain i'm not going to fix you we're going to enter the realm of management um we 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 I uh, really need to read that more often than we do. Uh, and then maybe we're more fair, more honest with our patients. I just want to touch, especially, as I said, I want to touch on opioids and then I'm going to move on to cannabis because they're in particular that are, are areas where we are really doing a disservice, uh, not in my view. I don't think I'm allowed to view, just in, in, in the view of the evidence. And that's probably more important. And I just love this quote. Um, I think uh, Mark Twain was credited saying it first and many other people have taken credit for saying it subsequently. But look, uh, to someone with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And to be honest with you, I think that's part of the issue with the opioid issue. We, we um, uh, um, Any sort of pain, opioids will fix it. End of problem. Um, but is that the case? And um Again, a different BMJ article, but uh, uh, just to compare and contrast our, our acute pain management and our chronic pain management. And in particular, um, I said we're good at acute pain. We're better at acute pain than chronic pain, uh, but we're not that good either. Now, this is a meta-analysis, um, uh, gathering together as many pa patients as possible. I think I think there's 20,000 papers, uh, sorry, 20,000 patients uh, were looked at with this um, series. And the question was, can we reduce post-operative pain by 50%. Now, that's really quite important. It's not can we eliminate post-operative pain, go from uh, whatever out of 10 to naught out of 10. Can we reduce it by 50%? How good are we at that? And unnecessarily busy slide, I will simplify. We're trying to reduce uh, pain by 50%. How good are we? Well, the very, very best we are is just under three quarters. So more than a quarter of people with a combination of pandan brufen will all say it's more than 50%. Paracetamol, oxycodone, um, only two thirds of people. So even with the acute pain, we're not as hot as we thought we were, but let's try this. And and, and I must be honest with you, um, in my career, I, you so rarely see this, but now this is chronic pain. And this was looking at either fibromyalgia um, or osteoarthritis and chronic lower back pain. And again, the outcome is the same, not eliminating pain, reducing by 50%. Can we reduce pain by 50%? Uh, and look at the bottom here with oxycodone between 40 and 100 milligrams per 24 hours that's the morphine equivalent of 60 to 150 milligrams of morphine per 24 hours nobody zero how often do you see zero published in something like the bmj uh, that's the first and last time i've ever seen it so um, here we are getting repeat prescriptions after repeat prescriptions for tramadol oxycodone morphine inserto fentanyl patches insert whatever your favorite opioid is um and the data shows that um 
we are not reducing that pain by 50 percent let alone not get, getting rid of it um and so that statement before that we i think we need a bit of modesty in what we do certainly certainly as prescribers um before we can actually start helping people so um Where's it going wrong? Well, there's two big things which we really need to learn about. One is this concept of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. It's such a paradox that it that is where we give opioids, and in the first blush, they will reduce pain, and they are brilliant at reducing acute pain. Um, my broken toe, which I stubbed uh, against whatever this morning, um, I go and get some help, um, a blast of intravenous morphine, and I'm just saying, yeah, I love you. That's fantastic. Uh, that pain is now gone. Thank you very much indeed can you now fix it for me um so for the acute pain we're really good but once the opioids are on board and within and it some people say within 48 hours of them getting on board this process i'm going to describe starts happening and that's opioid induced hyperalgesia where the opioids make pain worse um, and not better and the treatment for this is to withdraw completely off the opioids and then the pain genuinely gets better uh, and it, it'll happen at any dose of any opioid but once we're over the 40 milligram morphine equivalent per 24 hours then we really are entering the territory where we're going to have this opioid opioid induced hyperalgesia and what is happening is that the opioids will go to the opioid receptors and will try and reduce pain and at exactly the same time uh, they will do the following they will stimulate those nmda receptors you remember a few slides ago they were the nasty people they can act autonomously and they communicate pain quite happily to the brain they land on the glial cells and they land on these things called toll receptors on the glial cells and those glial cells in turn will then squirt all sorts of inflammatory mediators, mediators into that first and second order neuron interface. And that's what that means, at least they increase the amount of glutamate between those neurons. And then they'll go on to different parts of the central nervous system. And just like the sensitization will encourage the release of inflammatory mediators, which will aggravate pain and try and sensitize the central nervous system. So the very agent we think we're doing a great job with is become our worst enemy and is creating pain, which is a paradox because we keep repeat prescribing it. So, that's the opioid induced hyperalgesia, but wait, there's more. Uh, and uh, this is one of um, the opioid sort of uh, more closely guarded secrets is, is um, this phenomenon of endocrinopathy. And the opioids not only will do as described to try and get some more pain going when they should be trying to reduce it, but they'll suppress the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Uh, and across the board, then we will have uh, reduced, in particular, reduced sex hormones and reduced cortisol. Now, the sex hormones are unpleasant in their own right, but when we are permanently reducing cortisol, we're genuinely putting people at risk of an Addisonian crisis for an acute physiological stress. Um, and there is nothing entertaining about that at all. And so this is... um the sort of the classic uh, um, uh, endocrinopathy uh, description, really. Um, so uh, long-term opioid therapy for either addiction or chronic pain often induces hypogonadism uh, and symptoms include loss of libido, infertility, fatigue, depression, anxiety, loss of muscle strength and mass, osteoporosis and compression fractures in men and women, impotence in men and menstrual irregularities in latter in women. The interesting thing is a lot of those symptoms we write off as being part of the chronic persistent pain um, complex and say, well, gosh, you're in pain. Who wouldn't have all those symptoms? Uh, and the answer is who wouldn't is somebody who's not on the opioids we're giving for the very condition which we think we're treating and paradoxically making it worse. And as I said before, if all you've got is a hammer, you can make anything look like a nail. And, and I just want to touch on medicinal cannabis and uh, uh, certainly uh, a common question which which I get asked everywhere is um, what is my opinion on medicinal cannabis? And to be honest with you, my, my answer is I shouldn't have an opinion. It's what does the evidence show? What does the research show? And what are the guidelines on it? Um, and and I think it's um, uh, sad to see that there's a a, a, a a jumping of the gun uh, and and we're now seeing uh, things like the pain clinic um have some cannabis and and if ever there's false advertising that, that's really got to be it um if we're going to look at what evidence we've got for pain with medicinal cannabis um it's going to be very difficult to look at the reason being that medicinal cannabis has not completed phase one trials yet i don't know of any other medication which we think about prescribing which hasn't completed phase three the anti-vaxxers um when covid was um being vaccinated against we're all up in arms and saying we're anti-vaxxers because it's a new thing it's only approaching the end of phase three trials what do we know about it i think it's a bit of an irony that an awful lot of the anti-vaxxers were also very very pro medicinal cannabis little did they know that it had not completed phase one trials so to a certain degree to talk about 
doing trialing anything which hasn't completed phase one is, is a bit difficult. And as you can well imagine, given that fact, it hasn't completed phase one trials yet, the data therefore uh, on randomized control trials is going to be a little bit dodged because a really good sound ethical committee won't pass a trial protocol um, to trial something hasn't completed phase one when we're trying to do a phase three data on it. So so what data we've got is, is not clean. But what data we do have um, when we try and tidy it up shows that the numbers needed to treat is 25 and the numbers needed to harm is seven. In other words, um, if we line up 100 people with chronic persistent pain, and give them all the same dose of medicinal cannabis. Uh, only four will say that worked and the other 96 will be jealous. Um, now, given those odds uh, to sort of establish yourself as a pain clinic and say, we give medicinal cannabis, we'll get rid of the pain. It, it, if ever there was false advertisers, that, that's gotta be it. Um, if you had a laundrette and you returned 90% of the clothes as dirty as you were when went through, it wouldn't last too long at the high street, but somehow we, we, we're doing that with medicinal cannabis, which is, a bit of a concern, but let's let's get a little bit more scientific. Let's get a bit real. Um, a few years ago, a team of ethicists were um, commissioned with, with with genuine looking at the ethics of medicinal cannabis, uh, and uh, and looking at it uh, really about as objectively as you can, and saying how does medicinal cannabis sit with the Medicines Act, which is what determines everything we prescribe. And if we are prescribing outside the Medicines Act, um, we, we really are um, threatening our registration. So so how does it sit with the Medicines Act? Um, and here we go. Well, the Medicines Act, which we work on, describes a medicine as any substance or article manufactured or imported or sold wholly or principally for a medicine to one or more human being for a therapeutic purpose, and it achieves or is likely to achieve its principal intended action. And any substance or article that is manufactured, imported, sold uh, for the use of a therapeutically active ingredient um, or belong to a class as declared by regulations, etc. So off we go. Now, where does medicinal cannabis fit with this one? And the ethicists looked at every bit of data they could and, and, and um, concluded that it may meet A1, i.e. it's manufactured, imported, and sold with the intention of, fair enough, um, possibly b1 for the same reasons however um with very few exceptions um uh, achieve fulfills the uh, requirements of two and um and it requires a real change in regulations to get b2 through so the conclusion of the ethicist was and i love the wording of this that without appropriate regulatory change prescribing most cannabis-based products is incautious under the act now then every other medicine we prescribed if it was incautious under the act we wouldn't prescribe it it's quite easy but somehow um it, it seems a popular thing to prescribe in spite of the data i've just given um this is again from the report from the ethicist saying good prescribing practice requires that a doctor's customary pre prescribing conforms within reason to the patterns established by the doctor's peers. Um, now then, that's a really important line. And I, I've been going to CME meetings for the last 30 odd years. And uh, in particular, I noticed that the ophthalmologists are really popular. And the question for what should we do with this? Tell us what to do with that. Um, when the cardiologist is being, what's the best treatment for heart failure, respiratory? Um, how, what's the best treatment for emphysema? Tell me what the best treatment is. We go to the experts and say, tell me what to do. And then we do it. Um, and, and, and we face do it too so what about chronic persistent pain and medicinal cannabis ask the experts the faculty of pain medicine and the pain specialists should we give medicinal cannabis and the answer is no um it's black and white please do not um the recommendation from the peak advisory pain body is quote do not prescribe currently available cannabinoid products to treat chronic non-cancer pain unless part of a registered clinical trial but we're all doing it uh and and that's extraordinary um so I, just um uh, if anybody is prescribing this cannabis, just bearing in mind it's incautious under the 1981 Act. It has not completed phase one trials yet. Numbers needed to treat it is 25 and nobody needed to harm is seven. And the peers who are the experts in this realm say don't. Um, and then off you go. It, it's, it's all yours. Um, what's even worse is, and I'm going to come back to this next, but the um, certainly Australia says that best practice in pain management involves multidisciplinary teams and the socio-psycho-biomedical approach. In other words, um, we do need to involve other allied professionals, physiotherapists, health psychologists, occupational therapists, etc. unless it's cannabis. And then all you need to do for this one is book an online consultant on a consultation, speak to a consultant, get your script, 
problem solved. If only pain medicine was that easy, I wouldn't be here talking to you and you wouldn't be seeing about 20% of your patients um, with disappointing results to almost any prescription we give them. I think the, the important thing is we do protect ourselves from anecdotal data. It's, it's a lovely expression which says the plural of anecdote is anecdotes and not data. And we've all got people who say, well, I took it and I felt great. Um, well, I'm really pleased for you. You were that um, one in 25 and that's marvellous. But the other 24 are very jealous of you. Um, I think it really is important that we, we don't let anecdotes dictate what we do. And I'm just um, going to take a leaf out of another book, uh, which is interesting because um, uh, we are at the moment relying on anecdotes only to justify prescribing medicinal cannabis but uh um if we look back uh, at a completely different realm uh, and and look at asthma uh, and uh, before 1960 the death rate from asthma was a steady one per 100,000 people and then enter stage left um the forerunner to ventolin um people felt great um isoprandin forte came in and uh, and it, it was a really good book beta agonists being inhaled and people thought wonderful thank you for that inhaler god I, i've been struggling to know and that's the best inhaler out anecdotally fantastic treble the death rate all credits to public health people at the time worked out fairly quickly this introduction new inhaler trebled the death rate uh, and i spent forte was removed off the market and the death rate returned to baseline until Veritech came in um and uh again loved people loved it that it was that they, they couldn't breathe breathed and and, uh, and thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. But look what happened to the death rate. This isn't an inconvenient uh, rash or or, um, or or a headache or, or some other mild. It is death. Um, death rate quadrupled. Um, the study which put um, the need on the map in 1990 published in The Lancet uh, that proved beyond all reason without regular beta agonists should not be given. Um, that's the reason why the death rate is quadrupled because we're giving regular beta agonists. The public, pub, people who published that got death threats, literally death threats. Do not take my inhaler off the market. I'm using this inhaler. I think it's great. If you take it off, I'll kill you. And, and that, that, was, that was the way the dialogue went for about uh, 10 years afterwards. Um, it was extraordinary. Finally, it went off and, and finally um, everything's been worked out. The trouble with anecdotes, therefore, is that um, not only does it go at right angles to science, but certainly in the asthma realm, um, anecdotes kill people. Um, and I don't know how else to word that. We do not know whether cannabis will or not. It's too early. When something just hasn't completed phase one trials yet, good luck with that. I think I've made my point. So um, I don't want to depress everybody, um, far from it. Uh, but um, I just want to just, just be real, uh, really more than anything. So what can we do? As I said before, we've got this biopsychosocial model uh, and we should be looking at that. And uh, there's the next stitch of modesty, but the prescriber bit, my bit, the doctor bit, is going to be 20% of the whole picture. If we've got delusions of grandeur that were more than that, we need to go back and probably re-listen to this slideshow with somebody else presenting it. But what can we do? Because 20% is 20%. Take 20% of the All Blacks off the paddock. They're not going to do too well with the game. So we can't underestimate that. And this is a deliberately complicated slide. But what I wish to point out, um, touched on the neurobiology before, and the neurobiology of how we perceive pain um, has been worked out over the last 40 years with which pathways do what and what chemicals do what. And to summarize it very, very crudely, uh, we've got an ascending pathway. That's where we've got first, second order, and um, third order neuron going up to the brain. But we've also got a descending pathway. Now, you may remember a few slides ago, I pointed out that PAG, that periactive well, I can't say it, periaqueductal grey matter. And that was a really important thing, because if we stimulate that periaqueductal grey matter, that activates descending pathways, which has the spinal cord to calm down and stop sending painful signals back up again. And we can stimulate that. And I'm just going to simplify these two slides by just... Um, saying what can we do pharmacologically so as i said before we've got an upward pathway causing pain a downward pathway is our natural anti-pain pathway and so if we want to reduce the brain's perception of pain we can either reduce that one and we can reduce that by giving the gabapentinoids or we can activate the descending pathways by stimulating that periaqueductal gray matter and that's where the noradrenaline reuptake inhibiting antidepressants come in and and i think i just want to reinforce that it is noradrenaline reuptake ones unfortunately the selective serotonin reuptake inhibiting ones might address depression but then doing nothing to the pag and they're doing nothing to activate inhibitory descending pathways so we really need to get the noradrenaline uh, reuptake ones going now that is low dose 
clicks at a lower dose than is required to be an antidepressant, amitriptyline, the body turns to amitriptyline into more triptyline, and the more modern ones, bendafaxine, bertazapine, and bupropion are probably the top ones we can use. Um, and there is a possibility of synergy between the two, but the latest data is suggesting that we've overestimated the synergy between, between um, the gabapentinoids and an NRI. Interesting enough, what do we do with flare-ups? Now, what's interesting is how surgeons, what we do with flare-ups is we admit them, we give them intravenous opioids, we do some blood tests, do a CT at the back, say there's nothing wrong, send them home. What, what is uh, uh, interesting is around the world, if we look at um, the international evidence, what we should be doing with flare-ups, that's this flare-up of an existing condition, not a new condition. But let's um, have a look and see what Australia say we should be doing, what London says we should be doing, um, the UK guidelines, all of those are uh, on the non-pharmacological realm and all of the flare-up guidelines around the world in the western world say do not use any medications go for a walk do mindfulness um do what you've learned pain management program manage your pain and so a non-biomedical approach is the recommended approach for flare-ups and the non-pharmacological logical aspect if we're 20 percent, obviously 80 percent is non-pharmacological and i am not uh, a an ot i'm not a physiotherapist i'm not a health psychologist i'm going to have the arrogance to say what they do in detail but but the principles are the graded exercise therapy avoiding booming and busting going into pacing cognitive behavioral therapy acceptance and commitment therapy emdr that's the uh, realm which, which they look at and that's 80 percent how we can help people manage their pain and reduce their pain burden and improve functionality so what do we do in the tertiary center and i just want to touch on that and then sort of must compare and contrast what uh, what we what we um what we don't do really by and large it, bearing in mind, and this is this is really saddens me for general practice, is we literally don't have the time to, to do what we do in the tertiary centre. We we uh, just really make you really jealous. We spend an hour and a half with each individual person. Bearing in mind the average time they've had is about seven years of chronic pain, uh, and and this is the sort of detailed um, uh, picture we try and paint. We really want to know the pain journey from go to woe. What's triggering it? What are their coping strategies? And in particular, are they booming and busting? Is that the association of migraines is really quite strong, um, and uh, and uh, there's a very strong genetic component to having a chronic persistent pain and migraine. It's almost like the migraine gene is passed on there. Um, it's really important to know about the system involved, especially with sensitization. And I love this word space, and this sort of wraps up fibromyalgia. Um, S sleep. Is it non-refreshing sleep? Pain, how widespread is it? And is it tenderness? A, is the mood down? C, cognition, brain fog, and E, energy. And if they tick all those five boxes, we really are well on the way to say this is a fibromyalgia uh, pattern. Past history, family history, especially family history, migraines, as I touched on. And red flags are really important. They're, they're, they Just because somebody's got chronic pain doesn't mean to say they haven't got an undiagnosed myeloma the secondaries, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we do need to touch on those, especially for lower back with the quadriquinus syndromes of bowel and bladder dysfunction. It's important the functionality, the impact of pain, because really when we look at pain management, we've got two things. It'd be nice to reduce somebody's pain awareness. More importantly is improve their function and what and, and improve the functional impairment and many people unfortunately do. If one in five people have chronic pain, one in five of those are really severely functionally impaired. Um, need to say what are they taking, what has not worked, what is working partially, do they smoke, drink, what are the substances they're using and what is their background? And I think we've all learned this five. Um, what are they feeling? What are their ideas? What are their fears? And what are their expectations of where we're going? It's a luxury to do that. As I said before, one in five people have got chronic pain. 80% of those are expected to be looked after in primary care. And don't get me too political, but we can't. I don't know how else to do it. You can be an idiot like me and spend an hour to looking after this lady who was having a stroke in Reefton. But the reality of it is um, we've got 10 minutes in the room. I hate that expression, the 15-minute consult. It isn't 15 minutes by the time we've read the notes, brought them into our room, done what we've done, ushered them out of the room, written the notes up, um, and get ready for the next person. Uh, officially, that's supposed to be 15 15 minutes in my case it never is and i never out of time but if we are then it's less than 10 minutes in the room in less than 10 minutes can we do that previous assessment i've just done i don't think any human being can touch on it so uh, that really saddens me that uh 80 of people with chronic pain are looked at 
after by the very system designed not to look after them. And, and that, that that is frustrating. As a result of which, people do turn to quackery, the osteopaths, the chiropractors, um, the, uh, um, uh, you name it. Uh, and um, and uh, look, if anybody's doing acupuncture, good luck to you. But it, 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 they, um, they, again, the BMJ studied it quite hard and concluded with this. And they said, uh, although the role of traditional acupuncture and neuro neuropathy pain is not supported by current evidence it's popular and it's relatively harmless and often used um and, and one could argue that if you've got a captive audience for half an hour while you're putting needles and taking them out and you're talking and forming a therapeutic relationship that's fantastic um and don't stop doing that um so um i'm nearly getting ready for the question time but i just thought um having gone through everything i've just gone through um uh, if you can remember how you answered the questions let's fly through and, and see now how those questions sit in the light of the information i've just given you so you remember question one with 52 year old man who's caught his uh and in machinery and he's got a compound fracture so uh, is it acute nociceptive uh, non cancer yes it is it's precisely all of the above an oral opioid acute pharmacological absolutely not this guy is going to go to the theatre and uh, oral opioids are going to sit in the gastroparetic stomach and go nowhere quickly. He needs intravenous opioids and go for it. Um, no addiction risk whatsoever. Um, reassurance, absolutely. Um, th th there's no harm in giving reassurance. Uh, um, uh, he's going to live high, high risk. He's going to keep his hand. He's going to be all right. Um, uh, and um, interesting enough, that that last one is, is of course, completely incorrect. It's interesting. Research has shown that we can abrogate as much pain as we can by intravenous opioids. Um, it will not influence um, the, the diagnostic uh, skills of the professional seeing them. Um, question two. Uh, the 54 year old woman just had laparotomy for bowel obstruction secondary to cancer. She's got secondaries. Is this chronic nociceptive cancer pain? Uh, interesting, no, it's not. She's just had laparotomy. Even people with chronic uh, cancer pain have acute pain. And the interesting thing about interesting, God, I hate that word, but um, the the, the um, challenge, I think, for us with, with um, uh, progressive cancer is we have a combination of acute nociceptive activity all the time and chronic persistence sensitization going in parallel. Uh, and so so we will have successes and not successes and both need to be worked together on that. Anxiety is definitely going to be an important factor and reassurance, false reassurance is just so destructive. Um, opioids are contraindicated uh, is the ultimate false statement and this one um, go for it and go for it forever. Everything I've been saying are opioids with the hyperalgesia and endocrinopathy, that's for chronic non-cancer pain. This is cancer pain um, and uh, need to say therefore E is a ridiculous statement. Question three, the 75 year old man, two year history of low back pain, which is all in his head. Forgive me, I just had to come back to my previous um, the slides there. Um, uh, this pain is acute neuropathic non cancer. No, no, this, this is very absolutely classic, classic chronic non cancer pain. Um, so the false statement a three months by a strong opioid such as morphine oxycodone um, is, is uh, I can't think of anything worse to do for, for this person by the end of that three months um, there'll be tolerance there may well be addiction there'll be endocrinopathy and there'll be in hyperartesia um, the not carbs and the pain can't be severe is is, is a rookie mistake um, definitely the, the red flag phenomenon that pain at rest pain when walking uh, uh, and it's important we, we, don't, we don't forget what we do for a living uh, and very much the um, non-pharmacological and the pharmacological this is this is the cornerstone for this gentleman 20 percent tell us 80 percent nothing to do with what we prescribe 24 a 23 year old woman with phantom limb pain uh, is it chronic neuropathic non-cancer pain? It almost certainly is, and, and that sits really nicely like that. She should be reassured the pain is not really there. It's extraordinary. Um, we do see people trying to do that. Of course, the pain's there. It's extremely weird, real. Um, what uh, sort of it, it amuses me is that uh, if you've got somebody with a bad migraine where they've got zigzags and they can't see a thing, um, half the head is exploding, they're vomiting the ring out, the blood test will be normal, the CT scan is normal. Nobody ever walks up to those people and says, no, pain isn't there, you're making that up. Somehow we've uh, let, let migraines go into acceptable but other areas of pain we don't seem to quite take as seriously as all the others and uh, so this is extremely real um explanation is very appropriate um cabapentin is appropriate as i said before if you're trying to suppress the upward path the ways there and strong op opioids are very much not appropriate and opioids in neuropathic pain um are particularly contraindicated but the fpm says opioids in all chronic cancer, not non-cancer pain is not indicated 
That's what I mean. Our 55 woman with breast cancer and she's got spinal secondaries. Um, and this is this is definitely acute nociceptive cancer pain, as I said before. Uh, opioids are really going to be important in her case. Um, there is no risk uh, of addiction uh, in this circumstance. Uh, reassurance that all will be well. Um, it, it, no, that, it, that, that never works. Um, it just discredits uh, us, our, us and distances ourselves from somebody on a very important journey where we've got to be honest um and certainly collateral pain is just as important in any form of pain as it is in the realm of psychiatry so i hope i've um to summarize um introduced very much the concept of chronic non-malignant pain i hope you've understood the difference between acute pain and chronic pain i hope i've try to give you some of the science and data behind medicinal cannabis and try to distance ourselves from the emotive uh, emotional part of that and likewise for opioids uh, and and i hope we can all start the movement of, of moving away from the 90s when uh there was this incorrect belief um, that if you're giving your price of pain, they're not addictive, they don't have trouble, they do. Um, and, uh, and I just hope you enjoy chronic pain as much as I do. So look, I'm going to sign off here to a certain degree and get ready for all the questions you want to throw at me. And I've got another cup of coffee going. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Buzz. That was uh, very interesting. And you um, squeezed a lot of useful information in just such a short amount of time. Um, and I love the passion you bring to a uh, topic that sometimes can be a bit of a drag in primary care. So it's very refreshing. So we've got a lot of good questions coming in. And if you're um, watching with us, feel free to keep um, flicking your questions into the Q&A function. <clears throat> so but some questions around um, acute pain compared to chronic pain. So is it true that treating acute pain adequately will reduce the risk of um, the pain turning to chronic? Yeah, absolutely, uh, and um, that's that's an awesome question. Uh, the the um, in fact, I really should put that as a slide. There is really robust evidence to say the harder we hit acute pain, then the less is the uh, risk of those NMDA receptors getting unplugged and joining and phoning their friends by these interneurons. So, um, <clears throat> absolutely. But uh, bearing in mind that the uh, uh, the how long is 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 hitting acute pain hard, and we really. Uh, should be hitting it hard but off all opioids within probably four weeks of of, of the initial nociceptive in, insult awesome and on that note what are some of the factors that might influence the risk of someone going from acute to chronic pain so someone's put here why do listening to your um neurobiology why do some people's synapses start to become dysregulated and their nmda receptors chronically activated no, that's a really good question. I think if we had a hard and fast answer to that, we could screen for them and 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 avoid it completely. So therefore, um, uh, we 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 haven't got hard data to be able to answer that, but we've got some pointers. Um, needless to say, a family history is really important. It's almost as if there is a genetic input for that, especially the family history of migraines. That's uh, that 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 really is um, probably singularly the most important uh, important one. Certainly, somebody's past. Um, if they did have um three years to get over an accident 10 years ago, the next accident, um, they, they may well not get over it in three weeks like they should do. Um, so how they responded in the past. Um, what other medications are on? a background um, of, of uh, almost any substance of abuse is going to be pre-sensitizing it. Um, and um, and the, there is um, some evidence to suggest that a, 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 um, a psychological past history might predispose, but I'm going to be um, cautious with, 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 with um, carving that into stone. So Buzz, there's a, a few questions around medication. So um, is pregabalin as good as gabapentin? Yeah, good question. Um, the um, uh, right. So, so the gabapentinoids per se, gabapentin preceded pregabalin. Um, when at the end of the day we're giving it to someone, it's how the responder is going to determine whether it's good or not. And some people, um, uh, gabapentin is fantastic at pregabalin, didn't touch the signs, and some vice versa. One could argue pregabalin is arguably a slightly tidier drug. Um, gabapentin follows what we call non-linear kinetics. In other words, if you double the dose of gabapentin, you do not double the amount in the bloodstream. Um, you put just a tiny bit more in, and eventually uh, it's almost like trying to absorb iron. The more gabapentin you take, the greater is the GI resistance to absorbing it um uh, next gabapentin is three times a day but pre gabapentin is only twice a day and, uh, and it's just slightly um newer and uh and um and 
it, they yeah as i say some people uh, it, it's almost idiosyncratic and one man's meat is another man's poison i think the important thing about medication though and and that this might be relevant to subsequent questions but we just got to remember that medication is an adjunct to and not a replacement uh, for the uh, the psychosocial part of things and the the, the way i sort of uh, found myself explaining to some patients this is just imagine some running shoes if you've got somebody in front of you they want to win a hundred meter sprint you can uh, take their gum boots off and give them five hundred dollar Nike running shoes and say, "There you are, you'd be great." And it's a fantastic. Uh, I'll put the shoes on. If they didn't train, ate all the wrong stuff, and and just played PlayStation and then entered the Olympics, they're not going to win the race. And to a certain degree, medication is like that. If medication is is part of of their their recovery, and and we've got the necessary. Um, uh, psychology and movement and pain does not equal harm and don't boom and bust and pace yourself etc etc if we put all those in uh, as well then um then we're going to have a a pain management and uh, and and an improvement in function which is our end point but some more questions around around medications is mm. there any role for low dose naltrexone in chronic pain particularly fibromyalgia Oh god I'm glad you asked um the, can you ask that in, in 5 years time um the, the and I'm going to I'm going to get in a time capsule uh, and assume you did ask me that in five years time. Uh, I'll say almost certainly yes, that there is really, really impressive preliminary data coming through. But it is preliminary data. And um, I, I, I think uh, like many things, um, it, that there is wisdom in waiting for more robust data to come through. And if we jump on a bandwagon too soon, we might find ourselves doing what we did with Adifax in the mid nineties. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was the most ultimate, fantastic weight loss drug. It was an, an amphetamine derivative, which didn't make people high and it just halved people's cholesterols. They lost the diabetes, they halved the weight. It was brilliant. Unfortunately, way too many of them needed open heart surgery to replace valves in post-marketing surveillance. Um, so we jumped on that bandwagon with a great deal of enthusiasm, then went up really sorry um, now then with any brand spanking new drug which is not registered to do something yet it's not registered for a reason and that is there is appropriate caution uh, and so um my strong suspicion is that in five years time uh, we, we we might have brushed that caution to one side because it is an old drug moreover as, as the question correctly points out it's very low dose naltrexone and we have been using it uh, in much higher doses for um for addictive purposes for decades so uh, my suspicion is that the caution is possibly over cautious um but the preliminary data coming through is 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 uh impressive really uh, and so uh yes there will be a role but uh, I'm going to repeat what I said. It'd be almost like a broken record. Um, medication is an adjunct and not uh, 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 everything. And if we just rely on medication, we are doing the patient a disservice. We have to um, have it in addition to everything else we do with, with the patient. Thank you, Baz. So we'll keep an eye on the naltrexone. And um, one of the last ones around medications. <laughs> No, it's great. I, I don't want you to what we do. you being a broken record. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. No, medication is what we do. That's our con that's it sounds, that's our contribution um yes. in, in the interdisciplinary team. So it is very important. It's important we get the medication right. Um and and uh I, although I must confess I, I spend more of my time in the orphan visual pain service de-prescribing instead of prescribing, but nevertheless, uh no, it no, it is important. And and that 20% can be overestimated, but it can't be underestimated either. It is an important mm. uh, contribution to the greater whole. Important adjunct. Um, and speaking of adjuncts, is there a place for clonidine patches in chronic pain? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked for two, for numerous reasons. That's a fantastic question. Um, very much so. Um, clonidine, of course, um, I, I did mention that that, that um, we either try and reduce the upward pathway or stitch on, uh, switch on the downward pathway. Now then, I said more general reuptake inhibitors. Maybe I should modify the slide because um, there we are trying to increase the available amount of more adrenaline uh, available between synapses and the periaqueductal gray matter. But instead of increasing more adrenaline, we can mimic it. And so being an alpha-2 agonist, um, we're having the same effect. Um, so so in that regard, very much so. It, 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 it's, it's an effective analgesic, both acutely and chronically. But London is even better than that. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's side effects, predictable side effects work in our favor. Uh, it, it genuinely uh, will calm people down. It will also be an antihypertensive its own right and it'll be a vascular stabilizer uh, and that vascular stabilizer is is arguably incredibly important for people coming down off opioids um that the, 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 a lot of people sort of uh when, when they're hanging and sweating in particular uh the clonidine will enormously blunt their awareness that that we're going from a respectively high dose opioid down to zero 
just talking of opioid redu reduction, um, interestingly enough, and the research shows this, that as people are coming down of opioids, and BPAC have got a lovely um, uh, uh, regime on how to do that, 99.999% of people don't have an increase in pain as they're coming down, um, which surprises them. And eventually, around about that magical 40 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent, um, that's when they start to go, good gosh, my pain is so much better, thank you. So um, uh, if anybody is on respectful amounts of opioids in front of you and they are uh, functionally impaired and uh, genuinely satisfy uh, chronic persistent pain, which is difficult to manage, um, get rid of the opioids nicely. Great. And so with the opioid hyperalgesia buzz, and what kind of percentage of patients on long-term opioids does that occur? I don't know. Um, I'm not being silly. I, I genuinely don't know. Um, mm. well, one could argue um, uh, I probably wouldn't. I, I, can't, I can't give a knee jerk in my experience because, of course, I wouldn't be seeing professionally the people who are perfectly controlled. Um, that would be a ridiculous referral. Dear pain clinic, can you see this person perfectly controlled? Then got no functional impairment. They've got no pain and there's no hematological or uh, lab sequelae to knee. That would be a stupid referral. Nobody would write that. So, um, in other words, we don't see the people um, uh, who is not affecting. I generally don't know. Um, needless to say, it's sufficiently well documented uh, and um i'm going to stick my neck out by far the majority of people on oral morphine equivalent and you can get calculated by the way to calculate oral morphine equivalent um, which sometimes surprises you especially when you're converting fentanyl patches or methadone it, it, your, your eyes will pop out on stalks but but um but but for people on more than 40 milligrams of morphine equivalent we always deprescribe and always see an improvement in the pain so um uh the um but i i, I yeah good great question don't know Speaking of opioid reduction, in the context of palliative care, is that relevant? Uh, look, it's, it's a very fair point. Uh, um, the, 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 it depends on, on somebody's palliative journey. If, if it's going to be a five, ten year palliative journey with uh, with a slowly progressive motor neuron disease, we're going to do harm more harm than good by introducing it early. Uh, somebody who's got three weeks uh, and uh, and they're on a pump and um, uh, and they're starting to shut down, that there, there's clearly going to be no limits. And one could argue um, everywhere in between. Uh, like everything, it, it does need to be titrated and that. And, um, uh, the um uh, it, it, it it's it's um it, it absolutely uh, depends very much on the person in front i think the important thing is um, that that uh, we we are reviewing regularly um is it working are they on too much are they on not enough just one point to bear in mind that um, the older we get the less well we tolerate opioids so um uh, a 10 milligram morphine for a 40 year old will have exactly the same effect as two and a half milligrams of morphine for an 80 year old so so we just need to be respectful of the fact needless to say the older we get uh, the more likely it is that we're uh, going to change tracks into an end of life pathway and uh and and what would have been appropriate for us in our 40s is totally inappropriate in our 80s um uh, and needless to say there's polypharmacy associated with that and um and if there's multi-organ failure then we need to just do our sums and make absolutely completely sure that uh um if somebody's got chronic kidney disease for example but when we're not um making them feel unnecessarily uncomfortable by when the side effects exceed the benefits but it, it, that's a really great question but it, it's probably a three-hour answer because there's some questions around non-pharmacological treatments including neuro-linguistic programming nlp in the management of chronic pain could you comment on that yeah look it's i i am um, it's a fair point and I, i'm aware of it uh i'm not aware of the data um, but but it, it, it's it's uh, the, the it, it's um I think it's one of those things where it, when it works it's fantastic uh, and uh, and um, and uh, I think like many things if it's not working then don't don't don't, don't pursue it uh, it's such a, it's an obvious answer I gave there but look I I, I am aware of its existence and uh, and I've got nothing against it is there a role for tens yes there is um, interesting enough um, it doesn't work as often as we'd like it to um it, it's one of those things it should work uh, and um there's like a wall um uh, made themselves famous in the 60s for um uh going for the gate theory and and uh, and attaching tens to it um it, it, it so i think it's like many things i might have touched on before when it works it's fantastic but but if it isn't don't pursue it um so there is a role for trial of tens it, it to a certain degree it, it is overrated uh, one could argue um uh, because of, of its, uh, let's, let, I'm plucking this number out of my nose, but I think less than 30% do well on it.
is there a role for psychological education before medicines are prescribed in chronic pain? Probably. Uh, it's, it's really, really, that's a lovely question. Um, I'm going to say probably. Uh, needless to say, uh, uh, I think, uh, again, we'll have to look who's in front of us. If they are severely depressed, um, if there is a very strong neuropathic um, uh, component, um, if they're already on drugs which need to be deprescribed, uh, I think to leave our prescription pad alone is going to be a re real challenge with that one. Mm. Um, uh, so, but um, but the assuming none of the above applies, uh, very much so. Uh, the the um, uh, I think one of the big problems people are do people do is is get into the trap that pain equals harm when it doesn't um and the people do literally boom and bust and functional mri shows that's a very pro uh, pro pain feeling phenomenon uh, and so the pacing phenomenon i a day you want to do too much don't do too much a day you want to do nothing do quite a lot so seven days a week you're doing roughly about the same um the graded exercise therapy um is you can only do this much now but if that's your goal then we very slowly get you up to that um all of those are extremely non-pharmacological and evidence-based um proven ways to improve function and reduce pain awareness um now then if there is no need for any pharmacological intervention and and that that non-pharmacological that I've just described is appropriate, then absolutely uh, leave your prescription pad alone. Uh, so, yeah, no, that, that's a lovely question and that, that somebody asked. And Buzz, obviously you see see a lot of patients in this realm and will have experience with what they find helpful. Are there any key resources, pearls, courses that we can direct patients to for the education oh, around it or self-management yes. that, that we could that we could use that would be really awesome yeah. if you can thank you I, I i'll tell you one we use probably more than anything and uh look to be honest with you, you next time i give this talk all these questions i'll put them on my slide because uh that this uh, that's an omission huge apologies yes but one we use probably the most is something called www.retrainpain.org uh, one word retrainpain.org um it's it's a lovely um website i think it's got about 20 different common languages as well there's a, a series of 18 different tutorials for patients to watch but here's the good bit each tutorial is about one minute long um so even i can follow it uh, and and uh and it genuinely very much focuses 99 percent on the non-pharmacological way of getting somebody from where they are to where they want to be this is a beautiful resource and uh and that's probably one we use the most to be honest uh, so i'll do that again dub 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 retrainpain.org that that's by far our favorite so there's still a few more about medications thus <laughs> Cool. No, and and um, look, so there should be. As I say, we, we are prescribers, and, and this is this is our realm. Uh, if there are questions about um, the nuances of physiotherapy or EMDR, I'd go cross sides. I don't know. That's what the clever yeah. people do. Uh, so no, delighted to take those. Exactly. Well, I might I might come back to those because we've got a good one here. Um, you mentioned that migraine history is quite important. I think you mentioned a family history of migraine as well. Um, yep. Can you tell us a little bit more about why that's important? To be honest, it's 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 important for numerous reasons. Um, the, the, the but the, it's almost as if there's a Mendelian autosomal dominant sort of um, uh, phenomenon. There isn't, but it's as if there is. Uh, there, there is a handful of of genes, migraine genes, uh, and and they generally do get passed on. The um uh, and and so uh, needless to say, anybody with headaches that that needs to be dissected out. Is it a unilateral, a very severe throbbing uh, headache associated with a prodrome and a postrome? Um uh, and uh, and then uh, if somebody's saying the tension type headaches, then probably not. Um, moreover, then that that flow on effect, the, the existence of migraines in their own right, is a is a risk factor for the development of um of this central sensitization and the chronic widespread pain and the uh, fibromyalgia line or if not pure fibromyalgia behavior uh, and a sensitized central nervous system well it needs diagnosing and then respecting and then desensitizing uh, by as many different means as we can get hold of usually mul multiple means to get in there all from a family if not personal history of migraines so regarding the medicinal cannabis buzz um we've got here that some patients have been allowed to use it post-operatively for example how how could we kind of communicate or educate patients that specifically for pain it may not be as effective of it, as effective as they've been told that it is very easily um we we move away from our opinions just just pure raw data uh, uh and um the uh, uh and and uh, i think we can do we can do a few things one data pure data um not completed phase one trials yet 
numbers needed to treat one in 25. Uh, that's a really good start. Um, next, faculty of pain medicine say do not prescribe it um, unless it's part of a registered clinical trial. In other words, an unregistered N equals one, give it a go, tummy a good arm. That's not registered. That, 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 that's cheating. Um, so so we, we can sort of, that's that's not opinion. That that's that's. If somebody says, "In your opinion, is the Earth flat?" So I ignore my opinion. Just fly around the thing. Uh, what a satellite stuff to say. It, 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 so so let, let's step away from that and, and get get on with scientific with it. I think the next thing is that um, just because a patient demands it doesn't mean to say we have to give it. We can very comfortably say, um, I, "I I don't prescribe it." Good luck. Um, uh, the the uh, they do down the road fine they'll, they'll charge you whatever they charge you um uh, and then sell you their product which is that a little bit peculiar in its own right but uh um they uh we just um stand our ground really and uh just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean to say it's right uh and um um the you mentioned that the number needed to harm is only seven mm -hmm. um someone was asking what what those harms might look like um, because there is some kind of um i guess maybe anecdotes out there that it's one of those things kind of like acupuncture it may help but it's probably not going to harm so why not give it a go right. yeah fair enough too uh look i i honestly don't know uh, the, the, the bearing in mind um that um the uh this is this is trial data from trials which technically speaking should not have been in trials in the first place how uh, I'm deadly serious. An ethical committee. Uh, I've sat on ethical committees. Um, if uh, they, they, nobody would even try to to get an ethical committee to approve a phase three trial for a medication which hasn't completed phase one, you would submit the phase one and phase two data and say we wish to take it to phase three. If, if it isn't there, it, it, it just won't get off the ground. So whatever trials have been done, one could argue shouldn't have been done. Now then. When trials are conducted, and I haven't done too many, but I've done a few in a previous life, um, the 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 category of harm is broad, um, and and uh, but harm is harm, uh, i.e., it's an un unwanted effect. Um, now, then, the, the unwanted effects outnumber the benefits by about three or four to one. Uh, that that's all I can say. So if somebody's saying what harm is it, uh, I honestly don't know. Um, and, but what we don't know is, um, and I say, but we'll go back to previous drugs which have been taken off the market. And uh, say with Vioxx, who would have guessed that would double the rate of heart attack? Antifax, who would have guessed that people are needing open heart surgery for doing that? Thalidomide in the late 50s was available over the counter. Um, the the, 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 the post-marketing surveillance does make us uh, stop prescribing quite a few medications in my lifetime I've seen go. What we do know for an absolute fact is we haven't got a mysterious cohort of people living until they're 170 with nothing wrong with them. And we do a an analysis on them. We discovered all of them were smoking cannabis and that was their secret. That cohort does not exist. So um, so um, now then uh, uh, what we don't know is if we do start prescribing medicinal cannabis, are we going to have a cohort in 10 years time from now who've got Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. peculiar cancers? We just don't know. But what we do know is, and I was having a chat with the Ministry of Health um, uh, uh, lawyer a few years ago when, when the uh, bill was being drafted. Um, if there is a class action in New Zealand against prescribers, uh, given its current uh, inability to withstand uh, the scrutiny for the Medicines Act, a class action against prescribers, the prescribers I'm going to like to stand on, uh, the, the, we, we're just just make sure you've got all your assets tied up in a trust uh, and you're close to retirement because um it, we're, we're completely screwed um so again uh, th that that's the medical legal risk which anybody pulls a pen out and writes medicinal kind of yeah business. that's right awesome thank you so much buzz for your passion your wisdom and taking the time to talk to us tonight we really appreciate it thank Have you a good night, everyone thanks for attending yes.